right is mirror that and to really give you an opportunity to work with a scholar, with a professional, with an expert in the field uh, to think about uh, a contemporary issue that really matters in the class that uh, the class of students that you teach tomorrow. Joining me tonight, by the way, is Libby Taylor. Uh, she's my colleague at the National Humanities Center and works the behind the scenes support of these American class webinars. Libby works closely with our scholars and our hosts to develop the corresponding PowerPoint that all of you will have access to tonight. She makes sure that the technology is working clearly and well. Uh, she archives our work and she makes sure that any problems that you have uh, in terms of your certification, in terms of um, registering and being a part of this uh, this webinar is taken care of. I want to fr frame tonight's conversation uh, actually in a sort of a first person way, a, a personal way. Um, last night I worked with my son who's in the eighth grade on a project that he had to complete for a social studies teacher. Uh, I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. My son goes to Smith Middle School and Chapel Hill Carborough Public Schools. And he was constructing a journal narrative of immigration in the 20th century. Um, as a former middle grade uh, educator, as a history teacher in the eighth grade, I remember this well. I remember these prompts well. And what he wrote about in a creative and, and, um, and experiential way was, you know, this narrative of him as an immigrant leaving Germany or leaving Ireland or, you know, coming to America, um, going through the gates of Ellis Island lured by opportunity or freedom or family. Um, I remember all the sort of prompts in that. I remember the um, the ways in which I set that up for kids. And I also remember that immigration as a key term, as a vocabulary word, really associated with and it connotated with the turn of the century U.S. history curriculum. Wow, has that changed. Every single one of you tonight, and we have 225 uh, registered registered uh, participants in tonight's webinar, every single one of you now has a completely different connotation with the term immigration and the ways in which that your students enter into the conversations you might have around immigration, um, the <clears throat> preconceptions they might have, the learnings that have already have occurred, the ways that they uh, take that, uh, that term and that definition and that, that concept and that construct and they make sense of it in their own world. Um, immigration has really become one of those words that's so commonplace in our national media and our national discourse. It's ubiquitous. And so that kids of all ages are coming into our classrooms, a really particular and well-formed understanding, they think, of what that might mean. And of course, as you teach history, as you teach the, the topics that you do, in many cases, you're unlearning as much as you're learning. And you're addressing these things that, um, that, your, that your students walk in uh, with already. I think the a primary goal of the, our webinar series in general, this American class series, is to give you uh, an opportunity to interact with scholars and professionals to really understand uh, contemporary issues and to, to really get at the heart of um, the resources and the instruction that you can use when you go into the classroom tomorrow. Um, we hope that uh, this kind of lively conversation and discussion and debate all will um, give you uh, not only a better informed, but a series of, of resources and tools that allow you to have these conversations with the students that you work with on a very regular basis. And I think tonight will certainly prove to be no different. We're very pleased at the National Humanities Center to be working with Primary Source. Um, you know, the, the sense that, <clears throat> that history and curriculum and the, the students that we work with transcend um, uh, boundaries and territory and and place is really important. This idea that global learning matters is critical to the way that we approach the humanities and humanities education. Uh, primary source, like the National Humanities Center, uh, is really strives to enrich teachers' learning and really find ways to provide these sorts of uh, opportunities for scholars and teachers to work collaboratively and collegially. And we're very pleased to, to work um, directly with them. I do want to reference you to their website and ask you to um, Take some time to bookmark this, to go and, and, and explore the resources that they have available. Um, these are all created with teachers in mind, with classrooms in mind, with learning in mind. And the National Humanities Center is very proud to be able to uh, collaborate and to uh, co-promote this kind of work that we'll, we'll be doing tonight. The Humanities Center, um, coming up on our 40th year, has always been a retreat center for university level professionals to really think through the best um, of humanities education and scholarship. 
and the scholars who come through our doors, you know, this year we had 680 applicants. We chose 35, nearly 40. Um, we just announced them today, by the way. Check out our Twitter feed and you can see their names and their topics. And every single one of these, these university level uh, uh, professionals really have a transformative experience. And I think that's what we're trying to mirror in our education work. A lot of this uh, revolves around advocacy. It revolves around better understanding the ways in which the humanities as a tool, as a series of disciplines, can better inform who you are and how you can approach the world that you live in. We also very strongly believe that understanding content is critical in this equation, that knowing more about the subjects we teach and the conversations we have and the world we live in gives us um, a better preparation for, uh, for advancing that level of understanding and humanities uh, in large. We also very much want to mirror the personal transformation that our fellows have. Um, being able to provide you with direct access to, with uh, the ability to contribute to the National Humanities Center is important to our education work. And as I look through the long list of registrants tonight and uh, the broad uh, geography and background that all of you have, it's important to us that we reach each of you and invite you to be a part of what we do, and we'll, we'll provide you with a, a couple of different opportunities to do that. One of them will be a, a opportunity just to access the materials we produce. Um, all of our work uh, is intended to create instructional support materials that allow you to go into the classroom and really mirror the work of humanity scholars. I'd invite you to go to our American Class Workshop uh, our website and look at any of our lessons, all of which are free and open. Um, take a look, uh, implement them, and, and the, the truth is none of you will implement them as we've written them. So we would love to hear how you have differentiated, how you've changed them and remixed them, and let us know what makes most sense for you and the students that you teach. The webinars that we're working, uh, that we're all gathered around tonight, um, are also an important part of what we do. Um, our webinars are a, a very interactive way for us to give professionals in both the teaching field and the scholarly field a chance to converse about these conversations. Our webinar tonight will be archived and added to our growing uh, repository of recorded, um, video recorded uh, conversations, and then we would invite you to go and check them out at any point and also access the associated materials. We've been thinking a lot about these webinars, though. You know, three, four, five years into it, we've got a a long list of topics and scholars we've worked with, but we're also hoping that we can make this more interactive and give you an opportunity to interact more directly with each other and with our lead scholar. We have added three new webinars this year uh, in May, and in each case, we're gonna be attempting a, and experimenting with a new platform. Uh, we're gonna be asking embedded focus groups to give us feedback, and we're gonna think about ways to improve this series for next year. Uh, these three webinars are meant to be compelling and provocative and relevant for today's conversation, starting on May the 2nd with a session on fake news, teaching historical understanding of the digital age, and working all the way through to a more interactive uh, hands-on session with the Smithsonian and a, a tool for working in their digital artifacts. We would very much like all of your participation. We'd like you to come and join and let us know how you feel about, about the new platforms that we'll be using. We also work uh, very closely with teachers in the classroom. Our Teachers Advisory Council is uh, at the back end of their annual commitment. Uh, on August the 1st, uh, the 14 teachers that you see in front of you will be rolling off of our council. Uh, in the next month or so, we're gonna be recruiting new council members. And we will be detailing this at all of our webinars, but also sending this out through our constant contact. We would love to have um, all of you uh, consider at least applying for and being a part of this uh, this council. We ask these members to do a variety of things that could, that contribute to our work, but more importantly, we're trying to stay relevant. We wanna make sure that what we do is not done in a vacuum, and that in fact, it's very relevant and useful for the classroom. Um, tonight's webinar is really intended to give Kelly Hernandez an opportunity to share her work with you, but more importantly, a chance for you to ask her questions and to interact with her on a variety of ways. Um, after tonight's webinar, you'll be able to complete an evaluation and upon doing so, download a certificate that you can add to your professional portfolio. Please make sure that you do that evaluation uh, because it's important to us that you gain the credit and 
um, the acknowledgement for being a part of tonight's 90-minute conversation. This webinar really does depend on you and your work with us. Um, this will be an audio-only presentation that's anchored to a PowerPoint that's been developed by Kelly and Libby. Um, you'll have access to this and all the primary sources and, and all the conversation around it, but it's, that's going to be driven in part by your, by your chat. In the lower right-hand corner, uh, you'll see that there's a chat in which all of you have access to and can contribute to. At various points, we'll be stopping and pausing to ask questions or to solicit your feedback. Anytime you have thoughts or want to share resources or there's something about what we're talking about you'd like to, to push against, please don't hesitate to type into that chat box. And my job will be to facilitate that and sort of pull out some of the primary threads to, to present Kelly. I also want to acknowledge the large professional uh, and personal networks that all of us have uh, tonight. You know, we're at this point uh, 82 participants in this virtual space, and we're, we're colleagues and we're friends. We're sitting next to each other. We're about to interact in, around this compelling content. But every single one of us has a professional network behind us. We have um, Instagrams and Facebooks and Twitter accounts that all feed into a much larger stream of conversation. And I would encourage you tonight during this, uh, this webinar to follow and tweet and share and bookmark and tag and text and friend all those things that we do uh, sort of intuitively now. We've also uh, provided the handles on Twitter for the various constituents and stakeholders tonight. And we would love to have you follow us to, uh, to retweet us, to share this work with others so that we can continue this uh, deep conversation in humanities education. So all of this really is my um, sort of long-winded attempt to introduce and welcome Carrie Lytle Hernandez to uh, the American Class Webinar Series tonight. Um, again, in connection with Primary Source, we're very, very pleased to have her offer her thoughts tonight um, on, on the history of uh, uh, immigration and, and border control. And I also want to note that this is the first of what we hope you would see as a two-part bundle. Uh, next week, we'll be offering a webinar on the history of violence in Mexico with Elaine Carey from St. John's. I almost imagine this as being on two different sides of this metaphorical wall that we often hear about in today's media. Um, I, I could detail all of Kelly's background and the work that she's done, uh, the books that she's published, the uh, degrees that she's earned. But I think, you know, I think in terms of introducing her, I'm going to reference a colleague of mine who I'm here at the conference with, uh, Uhura Williams, who's at Fairfield uh, University in Connecticut, who when I told I would be working with Kelly tonight, gave me an enthusiastic thumbs up to say, She's an amazing educator, for, first and foremost, and can really think about how to take this complicated uh, topic into classrooms of all levels. So, Kelly, I just unmuted you. I'm going to welcome you to our webinar series. I invite you to take the microphone and, uh, and lead this conversation. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Andy. That's wonderful. Can everybody hear me? Yes, your volume is Wonderful. So hello, everyone. It's really nice to be in conversation tonight. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm based at UCLA, but this evening I'm in a hotel in Alabama, and it's a, a nice way to round out my evening here with you. Um, what we're going to be talking about tonight is the history of U.S. immigration control in particular. But I thought before we got, get started, I'd like to hear a little bit about where you're all from. I see that some people are from Alaska, New York, New Jersey. Are there any other states represented out there that I haven't named off? North Carolina, Ohio, California, oh, another Ohio, Los Angeles. Okay, very <laughs> Lots good. Lots of folks here from all over the country, Kelly, including Alaska. That's, that's, that's absolutely wonderful because what we're going to be talking about tonight is really the national frame for immigration history, but taking particular regional perspectives. Um, also, before I get started, I want to know what you all are already teaching about immigration history in the classroom, and if there are any particular questions you have about exclusion and deportation. I want to make sure what we're doing tonight together is very responsive um, to what you're already doing and the particular questions you have. So I'll pause for just a few moments and let that come in. <clears throat> 
Thank you for doing that, Kelly. And, you know, any good teacher sort of takes that sort of um, litmus test of, of, the, of the folks in the audience and try to figure out where they are. Um, and you're right. We have a very broad and wide uh, geography represented in tonight's webinar. And so it'll be interesting to see how that vocabulary that you just presented means different things in different places. Okay, wonderful. I see Summer is teaching the Immigration Acts of the 20th century. So I'm going to presume, Summer, you're teaching the National Origins Act of 1924 and perhaps the Immigration Reform Act of 1965. Yes, she says. <laughs> um, Chinese Exclusion Act from Susie Quintero. Very good. Couldn't be more relevant today. I would absolutely agree with that. And we'll be touching upon that today. More Chinese exclusion. Yeah, we'll be doing quite a bit with that tonight. And reconstruction. Very good. OK, um, so please keep that rolling in. I'll, I'll be sure to keep an eye on that. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Immigration history, as Andy has already pointed out, has typically and historically been told from the perspective of Ellis Island and really reflected the experiences of largely European immigrants coming through that particular port. And that story of the nation of immigrants, the Ellis Island history, has been told to us as a universal story. But in fact, it's quite particular to the northeastern United States. Uh, one thing that's quite unique about Ellis Island is that about 97% of the people who arrived at Ellis Island were allowed to enter through Ellis Island and become immigrants in the United States. Now, if you move your perspective to the US-Mexico border, the El Paso entry point in particular, or to California and the Angel Island entry point, the story of US immigration becomes less a story about nearly open entry and much more a story of exclusion and deportation. And so what I want to do tonight is really focus on this particular aspect of US immigration history, the stories of exclusion and deportation, how we created these new realities in US law and US life. Um, through our efforts to keep some populations out of the country. Uh, this is a, u a uniquely regional story, and there's two ways of looking at it, that the modern immigration system began really in 1862 in the American South, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and it developed, it flourished, it, it fleshed its bones, in the American West. So let's go ahead and, and move through these two particular perspectives. OK, so what I really want to emphasize tonight is that although we have historically taught US immigration history through the perspective of Ellis Island, if we shift our focus to the American South in the 19th century, in the American West in the 19th and through the 20th century, we get a very different perspective on what the practices of immigration and immigration control have been at US borders. All right, so the first law that is passed to exclude targeted populations from the United States is passed in 1862. Now, you're all history teachers. You know that in 1862, this country is embroiled in um, what remains to this day uh, the most violent domestic conflict um, other than the, the Indian Wars. And that conflict is the Civil War. Now, what was going on during the Civil War is that as the North began to win that war, or uh, it looked as though the South was going to, to lose, planters in the American South, in particular in Louisiana and Florida, they under the writing on the wall. And they understood that slavery, the system of coerced and unfree and um, extraordinarily cheap labor, may soon end. And they began to look around for other sources of cheap and disposable 
labor. And as they envisioned the end of black enslavement, they began to cultivate Chinese immigration into the American South. So it's during the Civil War that you have the arrival of some of the first and earliest Chinese immigrants to the American South. And the idea was to bring them in to replace freed um, slave labor. The North caught wind of what was happening in Louisiana and Florida and passed a new law. And that law was the 1862 Anti-Cooley Act. What this law did is it um, prohibited immigrant contractors from bringing unfree Chinese workers into the United States. And the Northerners who passed this law envisioned it really as one, an abolition law, one that would secure abolition in the United States should the North win the war. But what it in fact ended up doing was becoming the basis of a new socio-legal system of creating an undesirable class within the United States. Uh, so, Andy, if questions are rolling in, please do interrupt me and let me know. I will. And so, you know, I think at this beginning, at least, you're sort of framing and setting the stage. And um, I think part of what we're hoping is that this chat will be a sort of an ongoing uh, churning of ideas. But there will be questions that I'm going to pepper you with. So thank you for the invitation. Wonderful. Yes, please do ask questions. I hope that this is a, a conversation. Now, when the 1862 law is passed, it's very early on. It's unclear in terms of what kind of legal system is going to follow. But by 1869, Frederick Douglass, the, the famous and the bold abolitionist who had self-emancipated himself, had written a new essay called The Composite Nation. I believe I had provided a copy of that to each of you. And in that essay, Frederick Douglass is looking at the rise of immigration control and thinking about what is the problem? Is the problem Africans who are in the United States or is the problem the system of enslavement? And he translates that to the immigration issue. Is the problem Chinese immigrants or is it the construction of a system that systematically marginalizes a population? And so I think it's really important to understand that as early as 1869, a perceptive thinker such as Frederick Douglass could see that we were on the brink of creating a new system that would, in ways that are both similar and different from slavery, construct a new category of persons in the United States. So it was not them as human beings that was the structural problem, but it was a system that they were forced to live in, the, the bundle of laws that wrapped them up. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a lot of comments about the relevance of this, this essay, and I, I do hope that you share it with your students. Um, this is a, a struggle that we have been engaged in for well over a century. And of course, one of the most brilliant minds that this nation has ever produced. Frederick Douglass is one of the first people to comment upon this new immigration regime as it was beginning. And Kelly, let me inter interrupt you briefly, if it's okay, just to ask this question, this clarification, which is even at this stage in the you know sort of mid, mid to late 19th century, it sounds like a big part of this is the categorization of or the taxonomy around what who, who people are, what humans are. Is that sort of an an underlying critical piece of immigration, generally speaking? So I'm sorry, Andy, you broke up a little bit. What was your question is the question of a human well, or just, the taxonomy? You know, it just seems like, like defining people in particular ways and categorizing people in very particular ways seems to be a critical piece. Um, you know, if, if you're that, if you're that, not this, that's where the system sort of follows. Well, absolutely. That is all about the construction of inside and outside and hierarchies. Right. Um, so whether it's in, out, left, right, that's been a tension within American society. So how do you define democracy by, or how do you define freedom in particular? By unfreedom. And this is the, 
critical importance of systems like slavery or like the immigration regime. How you define who's inside? Well, by setting the boundaries of who's outside. Um, okay, so Frederick Douglass saw what was happening very, very early on. And he saw it happening in the context of the American South and the attempts of slave owners to replace the enslaved population with a new marginal laboring population, replacing black slaves with Chinese immigrants. Um, that did not come to pass, but as Anglo-American settlement moves into the American West in the mid-19th and the late 19th century, it's really the politics of that region that lead to the creation of a national system of immigration control. Now, I want to take a moment to watch this wonderful video that I did not produce. Um, it comes out of Florida and Claudio Desant, called Invasion of America. And what this video does is shows the um, land transition from native control to US control through the 19th century. And it will really provide the basis of the conversation I'm going to have with everybody um, about conquest and immigration control during the late 19th century and into the 20th century. So Andy, could you run that? Sure, absolutely. There's no sound on this. What it does is simply show through war or through treaty or a little bit of both um, how the United States created its continental territory. There you go. Kelly, would you like to advance it beyond this? Okay, mine is still playing, I'm sorry. Should I I'm sorry. move forward now? That's fine. Okay, so as the United States expands its land base, especially in the mid-19th century, I'm sure everyone out there is familiar with the theory of manifest destiny. Um, I, I want to go back really quick. My PowerPoint has advanced too far. Can we go back a couple slides? Sure, you can just advance it in the bottom left-hand corner. Okay, let's. We're here at American Progress by Thomas yes. Gass. Yes. Which is really seen as the ultimate representation of the theory of manifest destiny that you have Anglo-American settlement pushing across the territory of North America, removing indigenous populations, bringing in Anglo-American families headed by men, and I mean nuclear families, reproductive families, um, and that no other population is coming in as well. And many people describe this as a particular form of colonization, that there are multiple ways to colonize a land base. Sometimes you go in looking for cheap labor, sometimes you go in looking for natural resources, in the case of Manifest Destiny, the push across the North American continent by Anglo-Americans through the mid-19th century under this theory of Manifest Destiny, this type of colonization is called settler colonialism. 
And that is really particular because it's defined that you eliminate or remove an indigenous population. The idea is not to dominate them or to integrate with them or simply lord over them and make them laborers of the community, but rather to take their land and establish a new idyllic, racially exclusive, in this case, heteronormative, I mean heterosexual, internally reproductive community. And so when we think about the conquest of the American West with the theory of manifest destiny or the form of settler colonialism, it really helps us to understand the pattern of immigration laws that are about to develop in the 19th century that largely come out of the, the American West and out of the clamoring of settlers in the West to prohibit and prevent certain populations from entering this new conquered territory. So into the American West, despite the vision of manifest destiny, many indigenous native peoples continued to live in the American West regardless of the wars, regardless of the, uh, the schools of extinction, meaning the boarding schools, regardless of the reservations, many indigenous populations continued to live um, relatively sovereign lives in the American West. And so part of the project of Anglo-American conquest would be to constantly um, eliminate Native sovereignty. And I want to point you to a, a recent book of a colleague of mine, Benjamin Madley, who's written on the project of uh, Native genocide in California, where both state and local and even the federal government reimbursed settlers for the murder of Native people. In addition to Native continuity, which was confronted by extraordinary violence in the American West, you have the arrival of populations who were not envisioned as coming um, to the American West through the vision of manifest destiny. And one of those first populations is Chinese immigrants. As I'm sure many of you know, Chinese immigrants began to come back, come to California during the gold rush, came by the tens of thousands by the mid 1850s. And the resistance was quite strong from the very beginning. So of course you have the passage of the Chinese or the, the foreign miners tax, which targeted Chinese miners during the gold rush. Uh, regardless of the passage of such laws, um, the fact that say the California constitution prohibited Chinese persons from testifying against whites in a court of law, which means that they were subject to rampant violence and, and theft, um, despite all of this, Chinese immigrants continued to come to California. And so by the 1870s, amid a dramatic economic downturn across the country, settlers in the American West began to press Congress for a federal resolution to this problem in, in their minds of Chinese immigration. And they began to say, look, we need the federal government to step in here and prohibit Chinese immigrants from coming to this country. And that's where you really get the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. It is the clamoring of white settlers in the American West who are opposed to Chinese immigrants who really force Congress to pass this new law. There are many people across the country who are opposed to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Cotton farmers in the American South who were eager to sell their product in China really feared the passage of such laws. Um, they didn't want to have those markets interrupted by diplomatic troubles. You had Christian missionaries who were opposed to such laws because they wanted to have free migration between China and the United States so they can engage in their missionary work abroad. However, the settlers in the American West won this battle. Um, they wanted a more robust exclusion of Chinese immigrants, but what they won was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which targeted laborers in particular. So between 1882 and 1892, the Chinese Exclusion Act was a 10-year law. Chinese laborers were prohibited from entering the United States 
in response to the concerns of Anglo-American settlers in the West who wanted to live this fantasy of settler colonialism. Um, after the pa passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, many settlers in the West continued to press for a much more robust exclusion. Their concern was that the Chinese Exclusion Act did hold the Chinese population relatively steady. About 100,000 Chinese immigrants lived in the United States in 1882, but 100,000 continued to live in the United States in 1892. And they wanted to find a way to root out and remove Chinese immigrants from the American West. Um, and here I've put down several quotes from Western representatives during this time period. And you can really hear how harsh they are. Um, their touch is pollution, and harsh as the opinion may seem, justice to our own race demands that they should not be allowed to settle on our soil. That comes from Congressman Cutting of California in 1893. Um, from, from Senator Herman, we see these Chinese form an exception in every respect to all races of people who seek our shores. Again, listen to this, this narrative of land and the importance of settler colonialism, land and settler colonialism. We believe that they are not a part and parcel of the world's people with whom it is desirable that we should intermingle. It is high time our gateways should be double locked and barred against the Mongolia. So it's this type of rhetoric that is circling at the moment that the Chinese Exclusion Act is coming to an end in 1892 that pushes Congress to pass a new law. And this law is rarely discussed, but I want to spend a little bit of time on it. And it's the 1892 Geary Act. So if you know something about this law, and if you've taught this law, please do let me know um, by, by typing it in the comments. The 1892 Geary Act was the extension of the Chinese Exclusion Act, but it had a few enhancements. The first is that it required all lawful Chinese immigrants in the United States to register with the federal government. Two, it had a provision for the rounding up and deportation of those Chinese immigrants who refused to, to register or could not register because they were not lawfully in the United States. If you were to get a lawful registration certificate, you had to have one white person to testify on your behalf that you had either entered the United States before 1882 or you were not a laborer. And if you were found to be in the United States unlawfully or found without a certificate, one, you would be imprisoned and punished at hard labor for up to one year and then deported. So the Geary Act is important in so many ways for us today. One, it's one of the first examples you have of an immigrant registry, uh, which is very much in the news today. And two, it really is the invention of mass deportation from the United States. We had had a few, the Anti-Sedition Act and whatnot during the early Republic um, period, but they didn't amount to much. It's the Geary Act that really establishes the modern system of deportation. Now, Chinese immigrants and their, their allies and advocates across the country, remember, not everybody was on board with this. Um, I provided some examples of some of the most harsh rhetoric of this time period, but there were many um, Anglo-Americans, African-Americans, many different people who stood in disagreement with this kind of um, racialized exclusion from the United States. Um, and Chinese immigrants and their allies fought the Geary Act quite strongly, and they fought the Chinese Exclusion Act in, in the courts. And they pushed a series of cases all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And it's in those rulings that remain pre precedent for today. Let me be very, very clear about that. The Chinese exclusion cases of the 1880s and 1890s remain precedent today. Those are the rulings that establish the basic framework of U.S. immigration control and the rights for undocumented folks in the United States. So 
I provided you all some links to these cases so you could read them for yourselves and share them with your students to think about the moment that created this system um, of immigration control. Now, the first ruling that comes out of these Chinese exclusion cases is Che Chan Ping versus the United States of 1889. And what happened in this case is Che Chan Ping was a um, Chinese immigrant who had received an authorization to lawfully leave the United States and return um, at a later point after the Chinese Exclusion Act. While he was out of the country, the, United, the Congress um, revoked these right of return certificates from Chinese immigrants. So when he showed back up at Angel Island, he was told he could not return to the United States. And he challenged his exclusion at a US border. And he challenged it all the way up to US Supreme Court. And this is the ruling that they issued. And what's so important in Che Chan Ping is that the United States Supreme Court defines immigrant exclusion at US borders to be a realm of governance known as plenary power, that it's intimately tied to foreign relations. And therefore, Congress and the executive, the president, Congress in particular, but Congress and the president have unregulated authority over determining who can enter the country. So here's the, the most important quote from that legislation. The political department of our government, namely Congress and the president, is alone competent to act upon the subject of immigration control. Now what is important about this is that means that the courts cannot intervene in actions of immigration control at US borders. If the courts can't intervene, that means that the United States Constitution does not apply. So here you have the creation of a form of governance at US borders to which the United States Constitution does not apply. This is a hugely significant moment in the history of um, US politics and democracy. But at this moment, it still just applies to exclusion at US borders. It's after the passage of the Geary Act and this extraordinary civil disobedience movement by Chinese immigrants across this country, but because most were living in the American West, it was largely in the American West, 90% of Chinese immigrants living in the United States refused to register with the federal government as required by the Geary Act. This is a level of compliance with a civil disobedience movement that's at the level of the Montgomery bus boycott. They made this law completely inoperable. What they did, rather than go to treasury offices and register with the federal government is they submitted themselves for arrest across the country. They would march into US Marshal's offices with lawyers in tow and say, I'm here, I don't have my certificate, arrest me. And they filled the courts and they filled the nation's prisons and they pushed these cases all the way up to the United States Supreme Court until um, the Supreme Court issued a ruling on these registrations and on deportation. This is distinct from the Chinese Exclusion Act and Che Chan Ping because what was at issue here is does the federal government have the right to deport people from within the country? That was the question that was circulating around um, the Geary Act of 1892. And in Fu Fong Yu Ting, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the federal government's right to expel foreigners is absolute and unqualified. So again, the United States Constitution does not apply. Deportation, it said, is an administrative process and not a punishment for crime. Now this is important because it says that deportation is so closely aligned to exclusion at the borders that the US Constitution does not apply. And that deportation in and of itself is not a punishment for crime. Because if it was a punishment for crime, the, the US Constitution would have to apply to the adjudication of that crime. 
So in turn, they define deportation as an administrative process, not a criminal proceeding or punishment. So again, you have, as it says here in the final quote, the provisions of the Constitution, such as securing the right of trial by jury and prohibiting unreasonable searches and seizures and cruel and unusual punishment have no application to the process of deportation. Let me give you a moment to let that sink in. The provisions of the Constitution, such as securing the right of trial by jury and prohibiting unreasonable search and seizures and cruel and unusual punishment have no application to the process of deportation. This defined the project of surveillance, of policing, of rounding up, of detaining, and of deporting people who are regarded as undocumented immigrants in the United States as to be a process that is untethered by constitutional protections. It becomes a exceptional realm of governance within the United States. Okay. As you can now, as you can see, Kelly, what what you've shared yes. so far is very compelling. We've got a lot of comments kind of streaming in, um, and and it's very difficult not to extract this and and apply it to the contemporary context. Um, there's one question that that I do want to bring up from Marla, who asks, "Is there any connection here to the insular cases?" Oh, absolutely. This is all about plenary power. So the insular cases are. Um, part and parcel of this form of governance, as is um, relations with native nations. So immigration control, these insular cases, native relations, all of this is part of plenary power and the construction of that form of governance. And one other question I want to ask, and I'm going to uh, stream this from Susan C. Uh, you know, it, it may seem somewhat obvious, but Kids, of course, will ask, you know, who is this Geary, uh, the author of this act? Who, who is Geary, actually? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Thomas Geary was a representative out of, I believe, Santa Clara, California. He was maybe a two-term representative. I'm sure someone can Google that and get it absolutely right for me. Uh, he was a gregarious guy, a little bit heavy set, was well known for punching somebody's lights out in a DC restaurant one night when they challenged his, his new law, the Geary Act. Um, and he was really the, the ringleader of this new form of immigration control. In his words, we needed a radical change to the way that we um, managed immigration to the United States. So I, I do see a, a comment here about Plessy v. Ferguson from Carol, and I will get to that in just a second. I think that's a really um, incredible insight that you, that you have here. Um, and that comes at the, with the, the third of the Chinese exclusion cases, and that's Wang Wing versus the United States that also spins off of the, the Geary Act. In Wang Wing, what Chinese immigrants and their lawyers were challenging was the fact that if in Fong Yuting, the United States Supreme Court had determined that deportation was not a punishment for crime, it, this is an administrative process, and in turn, unlawfully, unlawfully living in the United States is not a crime. It's just um, an administrative violation. How is it that people being picked up for undocumented, living in the United States without documents, could be punished by being sent to prison. Don't you need a trial by jury and their and constitutional protections before you can be punished with imprisonment in the United States? So this is the question that they pressed in Wong Wing. And what the United States Supreme Court decided on May 17th of 1896, the exact same day that they issued the Plessy v. Ferguson decision was this that the United States can forbid aliens from coming within their borders and expel them from their territory, can devolve the power and duty of identifying and arresting such persons upon executive or subordinate officials. But when Congress sees fit to further promote such a policy by subjecting the persons of such aliens to infamous pun punishment and hard labor, infamous punishment means imprisonment, or by confiscating their property, such legislation to be valid must provide for a judicial trial to establish the guilt of the accused. 
Now, rather than muddy this new administrative realm of immigration control with constitutional protections, Congress chose to move forward by keeping immigration law strictly a form of administrative law separate from criminal law, which has constitutional protections. So here you have the origins of immigration law being completely and totally separate from criminal law in the United States. By the late 19th century, it was not a crime to unlawfully live in the United States, to not have documents to live in the United States. It was simply an administrative violation. That remains true today. Because of this, um, undocumented folks cannot be sent to prison for unlawfully residing in the United States. In addition, uh, they define that detention, immigrant detention, is a usual feature in every case of arrest on a criminal charge, even when an innocent person is wrongly accused, but it is not imprisonment in a legal sense. Now, why this is important is because in the process of deportation, people are apprehended and held. And that process of being held or detained, usually in a, a jail or jail-like system or a prison, according to these decisions of the late 19th century, is not regarded as imprisonment in a legal sense. And again, can happen without constitutional protections. So immigrant detention except for several recent decisions, has largely been a process that has been unregulated by the United States Constitution. Now, this is a really important distinction to hammer home with our students, because many times they hear unlawful immigrants and they think that in terms of crime. But really, over 100 years of precedent and decisions has said that unlawfully residing in the United States is not a crime. It's an administrative violation. And when we see children being detained in warehouses and practices that seem unconstitutional, um, well, they may be unconstitutional, but the Constitution doesn't apply to immigration control in many, many, many cases. There have been uh, several additions of constitutional-like protections and policies in recent years, um, but those don't alter the basic architecture of immigration control as an administrative form of governance that is unprotected by the Constitution. And those decisions come out of the Chinese exclusion era. And though the Chinese exclusion era comes out of the American West and this incredible clamoring of Anglo-American settlers to expel Chinese immigrants from the country. OK. Now, why this is so important is that the Chinese exclusion cases create undocumented immigrants as a new socio-legal category of persons in the United States, as my dear colleague Mei Nai has said, as a caste unambiguously situated outside the boundaries of formal membership and social legitimacy. Not only are you a population in the so-called nation of immigrants that is subject to forced removal, but while in the United States, there is a system of governance which pertains sim only to you, to which the Constitution does not apply. And now we're going to go through and talk about how this develops a little bit over time. OK, so we have the passage of Chinese exclusion laws. But of course, Chinese immigrants continue to migrate to the United States. And I think that this is one of the most fascinating stories in American history. Uh, they, do through, they do so through a, several routes. One is they invent family members to lawfully um, return with people who have legal documents. So if you had a legal document, you could bring a, a son over, a daughter over. So they begin to sell paper son certificates to people who would like to immigrate to the United States. They invent false business partnerships with people. So if you had a merchant who was here lawfully, he would write down that he's got 22 lawful business partners. And those would actually be immigrants who are purchasing from him the right to immigrate to the United States. Since students were not excluded from um, immigration, many people opposed to students but actually came to work. 
and particularly important after the the earthquake in San Francisco in 1906 is people made false claims to citizenship uh, in the United States. Well, they would go to the immigration office and say, hey, well, you guys lost my paperwork. Um, I really am a U.S. citizen. I was born here and have birthright citizenship. And they would also pretend to be diplomats and travelers. I'm not coming here to immigrate to stay. I'm just passing through on my way to Mexico. Well, on their way through to Mexico, they would stop and settle down in Los Angeles or somewhere else. So there are all these different ways in which Chinese immigrants continue to immigrate to the United States regardless of the law. They also uh, engage in smuggling at the U.S.-Canadian border, but in particular at the U.S.-Mexico border and or with Cuba. Um, and they engage in cross-dressing. So here I want to show you all a couple of photos. These are some cross-dressing. Let's, let's go back one. Some cross-dressing photos of Chinese immigrants who were at the U.S.-Mexico border and had cut their cues and had learned a couple of phrases like, yo soy mexicano, I am Mexican, as they passed through the ports of entry um, trying to enter as Mexicans for whom there were no restrictions at this time period. Here is a couple of Chinese smugglers and an Italian-American who was working with them who were bringing people across the U.S.-Mexico border. And by the late 19th century, I'm sure some of you have seen this image before, the image of the iconic undocumented immigrant. Because of the laws of exclusion and because of the continued um, Chinese immigration, regardless of those laws, the iconic so-called illegal alien during this time period was a Chinese immigrant who was dying of dehydration in the, the desert lands of the U.S.-Mexico border region um, trying to enter the United States. So this is a wonderful image to show to your students to disrupt their presumptions about, to be frank, in their minds, Mexican immigrants being the really ahistorical, constant, unlawful entrant at the U.S.-Mexico border. This is a, a wonderful opportunity to talk about change over time. Kelly, I don't want to. Kelly, I don't want to take us too far uh, out of sequence now, but this image uh -huh. seems to be a good prompt to ask this question, which is. Yeah, in your own experience as an educator, as a scholar, uh, the students that you work with at UCLA, with teachers like tonight you work with, how, how much of what, how much of what you do in terms of this topic is is breaking through and sort of busting up those preconceptions that you just mentioned? It's hugely important. <laughs> um, I feel that in many ways, much of what I do as a historian is disrupting perceive consistencies, that something seems to be a historical fact because it's been true for so long, right. and revealing that there have been changes and in, in ruptures over time, and that what we see, what seems natural and inevitable is actually a construction of a particular moment in time, and that we too live in a particular moment in time. Yeah, I mean, you use that term, that verb, disruption, and it uh, in disrupting, and it really did strike me that that's exactly what you're doing, particularly in this topic. Although you might suggest it happens throughout, uh, well, that's what historians do, generally speaking. Yes, that's always what we do. Absolutely. Um, you know, for me, this is a very powerful image to use when I teach my immigration courses at UCLA. Um, we have many, many, many Chinese American students, um, and it's really an important way to use heritage thinking um, to break through and see that we all share these histories. That when we talk about Plessy v. Ferguson, when we talk about Chinese exclusion, when we talk about undocumented immigration, we're talking, and we talk about all this happening in a project of conquest on native land that we have Asian Americans, African Americans, Native peoples, you know, all of us are sharing a story together and we all have our own entry points to it, um, but we need to be in this conversation all together. So it's a way of breaking open our thinking and talking about unlawful immigration, which I think a lot of my students regard as something that belongs to Chicano studies or Mexican Americans solely. So and I'm always trying to find yeah, well, so I'm going to follow up on that briefly, um, because as you describe that, you know, and, and I will admit that even in my leading question a moment ago, I sort of set that up as, 
as sort of unlearning this misperception from a very particular vantage point. But I wonder, you know, you, you teach at UCLA, you've got students from all different backgrounds. Uh, I know that from our registered participants tonight, we've got folks who are working with students from all different backgrounds. Are you also breaking the misconception from the immigrant perspective? Is it, is it, is it a misperception on both sides of this conversation? Absolutely. <laughs> um, and it can be such a freeing conversation for many students to understand that um, there's nothing intrinsically about right. them or their community right. that is so disparaged and undocumented, but rather this is a story that has evolved over time. Right. And they're living in one particular moment. Of it. And that's a two way street, right? I mean, it's something that that we're that we're all sort of buying into in terms of that misperception. Absolutely. Um, this is one of the, the most, I would say, engaging lectures and weeks that I always have is on this early history of undocumented immigration, the construction of the so-called illegal aliens, Fantastic. the Chinese exclusion act. I also see someone ask a question here about where does this image come yeah. from. I believe it comes from Harvard. And actually, Kelly, I'm going to say that Susan is part of our primary source collaborators, and so I want to give her a particular uh, stage to ask that question. But please do. T uh, tell us a word about the artist and the source itself. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I believe it comes from Harper's Bazaar in the, the late 19th century. But let me I can double check that and, and bring that back to you. Thank you. So I appreciate you letting me get, get you off base just a little bit. I think, you know, sort of underneath all of this conversation are the students that we all stand in front of and, and sort of busting up and disrupting, as you suggest, that narrative is, is really sort of the primary point here. Um, we are at, at just after the eight o'clock hour East Coast time. So Kelly, we have about 25 minutes or so left. Okay. I will hurry it up. All right. So um, when we compare what's happening with Chinese immigration in the American West in particular and all the exclusions and deportations that are being developed around them, uh, you have to compare that to what's happening at Ellis Island where about 98% of immigrants were admitted as lawful immigrants. Um, so these entirely different stories. Okay, so the Chinese Exclusion Act leads to the 1892 Geary Act which leads to the Asiatic Bard Zone. All persons of Asian descent are prohibited from entering the United States by 1917, which leads to the National Origins Act of 1924. Um, I'm sure most of you are teaching the National Origins Act already, but what it does is it effectively establishes a whites-only immigration system to the United States um, that the vast majority of immigrants who enter after the National Origins Act come from Europe, namely from Northwestern Europe, and there's one singular exception to this, and that is that immigrants in the Western Hemisphere are not, there's no numerical limit to the number of them that can enter the country every year. Where that exemption comes from is largely employers in the American West who have become very dependent upon Mexican workers. Now think about this, this is really important. The first laboring population in the American West is largely indigenous and native populations. The genocide pushes that population to a nadir at the turn of the 20th century, under 20, 30,000 people. Chinese immigrants become the second laboring population in the American West. Chinese exclusion keeps them out. By 1917, you have all Asian immigrants who are prohibited from entering the United States. Anglo-American settlers do not want African Americans to move West. By the 1920s, Mexican immigrants are the largest laboring population in agriculture in particular in the American West. And so when Congress starts talking about passing a National Origins Act and putting numerical limits on the number of immigrants who can enter the country every year, Western agribusinessmen say, oh my God, please do not keep out Mexican immigrants. We are, this is the last source of labor that we marginalize, racialize, disposable migrant labor that we um, have access to. And so they win the Western Hemisphere exemption. Um, in 1924, the U.S. Border Patrol is established to, pat, to enforce this new whites-only immigration law. They're working in the U.S.-Mexico border region. Um, most of them are hired out of that area. Although they could enforce the law very broadly, they, they tend to target 
Mexican immigrants in particular. Why would they do this? Most of these guys who were hired in the Border Patrol in the 1920s and 1930s grew up in the U.S.-Mexico border region. They are Anglo-American men, and very, very few of them Mexican-American men. They are largely landless in a region that is dominated by large landholders. And they come from working class backgrounds. So you have working class, landless white men who are given the power of turning on and turning off the labor supply of large landholders, many of whom they went to school with as children and who had disparaged them in their terms as white trash. What do you think these guys did with that power? They could have gone and kicked out people for being anarchists or for being um, poor. Immigrants who became poor in this time period were subject to removal. Um, they could have gone to brothels and kicked out um, immigrant women. They could have done a lot of things. But in this particular social, cultural, political context, they exerted the power that they found as U.S. Border Patrol officers by turning on and off the supply of labor from Mexico. Um, this was an incredibly powerful tool for them. So that's why you see this turn from policing Chinese immigration and from to narrowing the broad immigration exclusion laws to a practice of just policing unsanctioned Mexican immigration in particular. If there's any questions about that, please just put it in the comments. So at this moment of the 1920s, as these new, this new legislation is being passed, as the U.S. Border Patrol is being established, Mexican migrants are making about a million border crossings into the United States. It is the high tide of Mexican immigration to the United States. Um, there is a, a dueling sensibility of what this rise of Mexican labor migration means during the 1920s. People who are more nativist say things like Mexicans are mongrels, they're racially unfit to become US citizens, we need to put some bans, numerical limits upon their entry into the United States, or they will, like an anchor, called, cause the downfall of Anglo-American civilization in the American West. Others, the employers in particular, say things like, we are completely dependent upon Mexicans for our agriculture, industrial, common, or casual labor is our only source of supply. So these are what I call the dueling interests of white supremacy during an era of, of American history known as the tribal 20s, a moment when we instituted a whites-only immigration policy, a moment when the KKK was on the rise, a moment when eugenics was a popular science about race and belonging in the United States. These were the, the dueling discourses about whether or not Mexican immigrants belonged in the United States. At a moment when there's this tussle over whether or not Mexicans should enter the United States, the nativists wanted all Mexicans excluded or deported. Employers wanted Mexicans to come in, migrate, and go back home. These two dueling sides of white supremacy came to a compromise on March 4th of 1929. And I sure do hope um, you all download this law and share it with your students because it remains law today. That law, which was introduced to Congress by Senator Coleman Livingston Blease from South Carolina, who entered Congress with no other purpose than to guard white supremacy. And he was one of the most rabid white supremacists of the 1920s. He was one of the few congressmen to actually cheer and advocate for black lynchings. He is the man who brings us the criminalization of unlawful entry to the United States. I see your question, Jennifer. We can get back to that in a second. Mexicans are seen as white. Um, section one of this law, unlawfully entering the United States after deportation, is now a felony. Section two, unlawfully in the United States, is made a, a misdemeanor. This is really important because the Chinese Exclusion Acts had determined that unlawfully residing in the United States is not a crime, and therefore deportation is not a criminal punishment. This is a, a shift that unlawfully entering the country is a crime that can be punished by imprisonment and then later deportation. 
Now, there have been many changes in U.S. immigration law, namely the 1965 Immigration Control Act. This law did not change. And this law is precisely what is filling up our federal prison system today. So when we talk about the so-called criminal alien, we're really talking about Belize's 1929 law um, that criminalizes unlawful entry to the United States. About 60% of our undocumented population today entered the country unlawfully. That is a crime punishable by imprisonment. And it was a crime created on March 4th of 1929 to, that targeted Mexican immigrants in particular. And it was a compromise between these two dueling sides of white supremacy who were trying to find a way that Mexican immigrants could enter the United States and work, but that we could guarantee they would not settle in the United States and become Mexican American citizens, that they would go home. And the way that they thought that they could do this is to guarantee that Mexicans entered the country um, documented in a manageable system. And they wanted to criminalize those who entered the country outside of the um, entry points. Okay, so the 1929 Act criminalizes unlawful entry. Throughout the 1930s, the Mexican prisoner population in the United States spikes entirely because of the enforcement of this new law. And I want to point out here that during the 1930s, I'm sure many people either know or consume that our federal prisons were full of people who were incarcerated for violating liquor laws, federal liquor laws. Well, the second largest population in our federal prisons in the 1920s, I mean the 1930s, were Mexican immigrants who were imprisoned for breaking Belize's 1929 law. By World War II, there's still an interest in having Mexican immigrants work in the United States but not live in the United States. And the new way that we make that a concrete program is by adopting the Becerro program of 1942 to 1964, which facilitates the short-term labor migration of about 2.5 Mexican um, immigrants during this time period, working about 5 million contracts. And what the Becerro program does is it facilitates a way for Mexican immigrants to lawfully enter the United States, work here on short-term contracts, and go home at the end of their contract, to not stay, not remain, not to settle in the United States. And again, you're seeing this politics of a settler state in the American West in particular, wanting to have access to a racialized workforce, but not wanting that workforce to remain in the United States as immigrants. And that's what the Pacero program is really about. So Kelly, I'm going to pause just briefly. Um, there's a bunch of questions, as you could imagine. The, you know, as you move into the 20th century, there are lots of uh, questions, and, and this is very compelling content. I'm going to sort of bundle these together, and you might answer them uh, collectively, cumulatively, or you might uh, sort of separate them out. Um, but they all relate to what you've talked about in the last five or ten minutes. Um, Thomas asks, "Is this some sort of guest worker program?" Uh, Gabby asks, why were immigrants imprisoned instead of just deported? Uh, and then follows up with, why would the government not want illegal immigrants in the prisons? And finally, Sandra asks, is it true that the Mexican population were invited to the U.S. earlier in time period to work on farms? Yeah, you know, is, is all of that sort of churning in what you're sharing right at this point? Oh, absolutely. And those are all wonderful questions. Um, yes, there is an earlier Brasero program um, in the late teens, early 20s. It's very short-lived and, and much on a smaller scale, but it's the same basic principle of facilitating a way for Mexican immigrants to work in the United States on short-term contracts and go home. Um, and I should say that the Mexican government was very much behind each of these programs. They wanted Mexican laborers to come to the United States, accumulate modern technological farming skills, and bring them back to Mexico. Um, this question of why would we want to imprison immigrants rather than just deport them, right? Why spend the money and the time on imprisoning them? This was a mechanism of punishing Mexican immigrants who entered the United States without registering 
with um, immigration authorities without submitting themselves to a system of documentation and control. Um, that's the, the strongest logic I've been able to find them articulate in all of their discussions about the criminalization of unlawful entry is the culture and the hopes that punishment would, sub, would force Mexican immigrants to submit to a documented system in which they could be better controlled, their entry could be better controlled. And there was another question, is this a guest worker program? Yes, this is a guest worker program, absolutely. Um, I should say that this guest worker program didn't work very well, that only men were allowed to participate, only men from rural areas in Mexico who had experience in farming. Well, there were a lot of other people who wanted to immigrate to the United States and, and work here, women, uh, young people, and non-rural workers, industrial workers. So at the same time of the Becerro program, you had a rise of undocumented immigration. And that there were really two streams here. You had a lawful rural male migration, short-term migration, and you had an unlawful, highly female, very, lots of children who were coming to be with their fathers um, that, were happen that were migrating in an undocumented stream. So at the same time you have the rising number of braceros, you have a rising number of deportations. And many, many of those deportations were of, of women and of children. Um, the deportations that were happening during this time period became far more complex. That as the United States and Mexico were collaborating on the short-term guest worker program, the Becerro program, they were also collaborating on the mass deportation of Mexican immigrants who entered the United States um, outside of the Bracero agreements. One of the ways in which people were being deported was by plane, another was by boat, another was by train. And here is a map from my book, Migra, which shows you the different um, methods of deportation that people would be arrested in California, usually put on a bus maybe and and transported down to Texas and then put on a train or maybe put on a, a boat and removed down to Veracruz, Mexico. These boat lifts into Mexico were described as penal hell ships that they took bananas from Veracruz, Mexico up into Texas and then they picked up deportees and removed them back down to Veracruz, Mexico. That was the, the circuit that they ran. Um, but people were also removed into the interior of Mexico on trains and by other methods as well. Uh, once people were removed across the U.S.-Mexico border, Mexican authorities took over their control and held them under armed guard until they were forcibly removed to the center of Mexico. <clears throat> the idea being that if you could abandon them in the middle of Mexico, they would be far less likely to return unlawfully to the United States. Uh, I see Thomas's question, has this punishment worked to keep um, illegal workers out of the United States? Well, you know, we can go back and say that this started in 1929 and it's been consistent since then. And we have maintained un undocumented immigration at the U.S.-Mexico border ever since then. So I would, my opinion would be that no, it has not worked. Um, but that's open for conversation for all of us to talk about. Here are some other pictures from this Bracero era of deportations, and you see the long line of trucks here that are crammed and stuffed with deportees, each and every one of them. Here is a picture of the plane lifts taking people into Mexico. And here are the train lifts, and you see a, a Mexican military man holding people under armed guard to make sure they get on the train and go down into Mexico. Hey, Kelly, can you, um, do you mind referencing the citation for these images? They're really interesting. Um, where did you, where did you find these? Absolutely. You're welcome to use these. They're all U.S. federal government documents or photographs, which means they have no copyright restrictions. And I found them at the U.S. Border Patrol Museum in El Paso, Texas. Wow. Um, so yes, here is a picture of the, one of the boats that took bananas and deportees on the circuit. Um, I find that, ironically, it's called the SS Emancipation. 
Uh, so this is a moment in which we have the Operation Wetback Campaign of 1954. And I provided you all with a recent op-ed I put out on, on this campaign. And I think it's maybe a good place for us to stop and, and have a little bit of conversation before we end because um, the current administration has promised to resurrect Operation Wetback of 1954 as an immigration control measure. And as I argue in that, that piece, uh, Operation Wetback in 1954 was really a smoke and mirrors campaign. That we were told mass deportations happened during the summer of 1954, when in fact there were very few deportations. And really what happened was a mass legalization campaign through a Bracero program that became even less regulated in the post-1954 era. So it is true that after 1954, fewer people were arrested for unlawful entry and fewer people were deported. So the statistics say to us that if they reflect on the ground activity, unlawful activity, um, unlawful immigration declined after this massive show of force during the summer of 1954. But when you get into the archives and you read much more about what the US Border Patrol was during, doing during the summer of 1954 it is, and after 54, it is clear that they deported very, very few people. They legalized many more. And after the campaign, the deportations did not decrease because undocumented immigration decreased. They decreased because they stopped aggressively policing undocumented entry at the US-Mexico border. Now that's a very different way of understanding what's happening, um, what happened during 1954. And also the political moment of that time, I find to be very similar, but with its own distinctions to this particular moment, that Operation Wetback of 1954 wasn't really about undocumented immigrants, Mexican immigrants. It was about a rebellion that was happening among farmers in South Texas who were meeting U.S. Border Patrol officers at their farm gates armed and engaging in shootouts with them. So you had an armed insurrection happening in South Texas against the federal government over this issue of Mexican immigration. And the U.S. Border Patrol, the INS, um, Eisenhower, all decided to shut that rebellion down. And Operation Wetback in 1954 was about crushing that rebellion. Now what we're seeing today is a sanctuary movement that is certainly strong in California, and maybe you all could tell me where else it is happening across the country. But ICE and DHS has told us that they are targeting sanctuary communities for raids and for deportations. And this is very reminiscent of Operation Wetback of 1954. There, there is an uprising, there is a rebellion movement happening, and that the deportation of largely Mexican immigrants, Central American immigrants, is a tactic for addressing that uprising. So I'm seeing questions come in. Um, so this is, I'm gonna leave it here because I think that once we get up to the 1960s, that leaves us at the brink of the modern immigration system. Um, we had constructed a fairly coherent system of exclusion and deportation coming out of the Chinese exclusion cases and evolving through the establishment of the US Border Patrol in terms of its shift towards focusing on Mexican immigrants in particular. Um, we have this crescendo moment of Operation Wetback of 1954, um, leading into the 1960s. But these histories are each most firmly grounded in the racial politics and the land politics of both the American South, but largely of the American West. So when we talk about the history of US immigration control, in many cases, we're talking about the story of Anglo-American expansion across the American West and the particular visions held for who can have access to that land and to a life in this region. The first targets for exclusion, of course, were native peoples. Those were the first 
forced removals by a variety of means from the American West. Next came Chinese immigrants, and then there would be a series of racially marginalized populations, Japanese immigrants, Filipino immigrants, um, and finally, Mexican immigrants, um, through which the immigration regime becomes far more refined in the 20th century. Kelly, you've shared an awful lot tonight. I'm going to ask you, we're just about out of time, and we may uh, take a few last-minute questions, but <clears throat> you've done a good job of bringing us you know, literally from you know, 150 years ago to the present. But I, I'm wondering, Su Susan was kind enough to post the link to your recent op-ed. I'm wondering if you'd like to take just a, a, a moment or two to, to reflect on the current and contemporary context of this issue. You've done so already. You've you've sort of set us up for that. But I'm going to ask you almost to sort of release yourself from whatever, you know, whatever sort of formal role you might play. What, where are we right now in terms of this conversation as, as an American culture? Um, I think that we're in 1896. Mm. Um, what is going on in the debates that are happening at the Ninth Circuit and now the Fourth Circuit and elsewhere are questions about what how much federal authority there is over immigration control without regard to the U.S. Constitution. So within the last 20 years, there have been a series of Supreme Court rulings and congressional, and Congress has passed a few laws that place limitations on immigration control. What the Trump administration is trying to do is claw back those limitations. Um, and take us back to a moment of 1896 when Congress and the president had really unregulated authority over immigration control. Now, this is very interesting because the debates over SB 1070 in Arizona, and I, I think we had some folks from Arizona, were over the same issue. And the Obama administration doubled down on federal control over immigration. Now, what that doubling down did without rethinking the basic premise of it all is it did give this new administration um, a bit more ground to make the arguments that they're, they're making. So it's, but my point here is left or right, we're having a, a debate over what are the limits of federal authority over immigration control. Um, right now, the new administration is losing that battle over the Muslim ban, but they've largely won it over these other issues about um, the priorities of deportation. So people who are simply um, suspected of a variety of crimes are now priorities for deportation. There's really no statute that limits that. And there's no Supreme Court ruling that does either. That takes us directly back to 1896. Um, so that's where I think that we are at. Um, whether you agree with that or disagree with that, it's simply, a, it is a very strong historical turn that is being made uh, with U.S. immigration law. I can't thank you enough for setting that up for us. And of course, all of the nearly 100 teachers uh, from around the country who will be walking into classrooms tomorrow will have to face that same context. And you know, I think the, the rich resources and the deep understanding you provided will help them better navigate that with their students. Kelly, thank you so much for leading tonight's webinar. Absolutely. Thank you to you. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us tonight and also invite you to uh, continue the, this conversation by exploring the American class lessons. Uh, in particular, we have one of the Chinese questions from a Chinese standpoint from 1873. Americanclass.org is a place you can find these free and open resources. I'd also encourage you to follow uh, the National Humanities Center and primary source on all of our social media including Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, our next webinar will be what I'm considering to be the second half of this, this bundled series, and that is A History of Violence, Mexico and the United States. We'll be working with uh, Elaine Carey, an historian at St. John's University, and be collaborating with the American Historical Association. And in my own mind, I sort of imagine this as two sides of this metaphorical wall that we all hear so much about uh, to really understand the the, the pushes and and pulls the drivers of displacement and immigration, uh, or forced migration, I should say, um, particularly in the in the southern uh, part of America. So we we would love to to have you join us next Thursday, April the sixth. Please sign up if you get an opportunity.
Don't forget tonight to go to the evaluation page, complete our evaluation and download your certificate. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, this recorded uh, webinar will be online within a few days and all the associated PowerPoints will be available to you. Kelly, thanks again. Libby, thank you for your help. Everybody, good night. We'll see you next week. Good night.